today. Uh, ushering in the presence of the Lord. Hey, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, I told Sister Karen and Sister Tanya one of my favorite dance songs, but I did not tell them that this is my uh, this is my iPod song when I'm in the gym working out. Yes. Somebody say yes. Y yes to his will. Yes to his way. Yes to his word. Yes to his work. Yes. To whatever God. Anybody here, you're not afraid to tell the Lord yes. Yes, yes Lord. <laughs> You do know what's best for me. Oh, come on, let's celebrate those dances just one more time. My, 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 my. Oh, my God, in the presence of God in this place. Oh, come on and tell the Lord, yes. Thank you, Lord. 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 We thank you for yes. There is a word from the Lord in John chapter 13. I just want to get one verse this morning. And let me uh, just celebrate. Last week we celebrated our stewards and stewardesses. And we thank God for the leadership of the church. And I want to thank God for our music and worship arts ministry today. Amen. Blessing us in the ministry of songs sung and danced. Come on, give God some praise with that. Music and worship arts, celebrate you all. Thank God for you. Oh, that's, my, that's my buddy. Hey, how you doing? All right, it's early in the morning. Amen. We praise the Lord for his goodness and thank God for what he's doing. John chapter 13, one verse of scriptures all we want this morning. And uh, let me also thank God for a multimedia ministry. These persons that operate on cameras. And in the sound room, those, that stuff is not easy. I did that 30 years ago. Uh, the mixing board we had, Brother Solomon, it took four men to carry it. We used to be on the road. 32 channel Yamaha PM1000. Thing was about as heavy as almost as a casket seemed like carrying it. Uh, so I do know what that's like. We used to have to go into prisons to do prison services and we had to set up and be mic ready within 12 minutes. Uh, to go, so I do know what that's like. So when they have small glitches, trust me, I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, amen. When they do a Herculean job, come on, celebrate our multimedia ministry. And I want to thank God uh, for Sister Carolyn Ross and also Sister Connie. Amen. So Wednesday nights, we are now streaming the Bible study. Amen. So persons who are not able to uh, get out in the evening. You can catch us in the Bible study, and you don't want to miss this week. It's going to be deliciously fruitful. I'll just leave it at that. Deliciously fruitful. That's Wednesday night, Tuesday and Wednesday night. Uh, one verse from the Message Bible, just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. Hop on over to the New Living Translation and get at it a little differently. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. W run over me with me to the New International Version. Since we only have one verse, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Just for a few moments this morning, no end in sight. There is no end in sight. As we get to know one another, good to see Brother Hawkins this morning. How you feeling? Good? All right. We prayed about something this week. We're looking for God to move. Uh, you, you'll get to know that I'm, I, I love movies and I love the principles and things that are illustrated and I love quotes. Um, no particular genre. I, I don't, I'm not too keen on the chick flicks, but 
you know, uh, I can do a little bit of Tyler Perry after a while, it kind of gets old. Um, no reflection on Tyler Perry and his creative genius, that's just my personal preference. Uh, I do like action and adventure, and I like the old guys, you know, the Expendables, that crew. Uh, I like Red, you know, Morgan Freeman, and the, you know, the old guy. Get, get, a, get a 50 plus something, you know, hello, somebody. Um, so I do like movies. Um, th th there is a series of movies uh, that comes and features one of my great heroes, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, The Terminator. How many of you are familiar with The Terminator? <clears throat> In the Terminator Salvation movie, uh, Marcus Wright is a death row inmate at Longview Correctional Facility, and he donates his organs. John Connor is the leader of the resistance against the control of the machines. Kyle Reese is a young future leader who is imprisoned in the cyborg factory. The T-Rip, RIP, which is a new model of Terminator, uh, which is a robot, all right, fights Marcus and discovers while he's fighting Marcus, this uh, half man, half cyborg, that he is a hybrid cyborg. He's more machine than man, but he does have one vulnerability. He has a human heart. And as you see through the lens of the of T-Rip the as he focuses in and does that uh, 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 ultra ray lens and looks and finds out that he's got a pumping heart, he, said, he realizes technologically if I can hit him in his heart, I'll take him out. Uh, he does hit him in his heart and he disables him. John Connor works to revive him before the T-Rip can finish him off. He puts electrical wires to shock him, but gets impaled by the T-Rip himself. The recovered Marcus takes a metal beam, tears through this T-Rip cyborg, and after evacuating John Connor and all of those who were imprisoned in this cyborg factory, it, John Connor is dying. Marcus Wright, standing in the triage tent, offers to give him his human heart so he can save him. Marcus offered his human heart to save a dying man. As the surgery to transplant this human heart begins and the movie comes to a close, the narrator says these words, quote, what's the difference between us and machines? It is the strength of the human heart, end of quote. Now, as gory as this may sound so early in the morning, it does present an interesting model of what it looks like to save somebody else by giving up yourself. Additionally, we can extract that one should never underestimate the power of love that's in a human heart. Now, the primary object of the love of God in Christ in these chapters of John is not necessarily the lost world from chapters 13 through 17. John is dealing with his disciples. We know where we are. We've been there for the last couple of weeks. Please don't ask me why we're tearing around this last supper. I do not know. I'm just trying to follow the spirit as the people of God are forming the disciples of the Messiah, the nascent church, the community of the elect. Jesus has loved his own all along. He now shows them the full extent of his love. Jesus' love for us has no end in sight. Not even through a couple of things I'll raise for your consideration today. Are you ready for those things? Uh, Jesus' love has no end in sight, not even through separation. Somebody say separation. Watch the scene in the upper room. It's just the 12. One of them is getting ready to walk out in a few minutes, and he'll be down to 11. But the multitudes are not there. Where are those who were fed with two fish and five loaves of bread? Where the 5,000 are not there. Not even the 70, because when he started talking to them, he said, you know, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And the Bible says that the 70 walked away. They were separated from him, but he kept on loving them. Uh, he turns to Peter and he says, are y'all going to go too? And he says, no, but where else are we going to go? You the one that has the words of life separation the pharisees the sadducees the scribes the lawyers and the critics are all gone it's just the 12 and one of them is really not all there before jesus reveals his innermost heart he clears the air space the heart of god will not always be understood in the crowd 
The heart of God will be accessed in an atmosphere of expectation and enthusiasm. Have you ever just wanted something from God so bad that you're willing to separate yourself because you want to have that intimate relationship with Jesus? The heart of God is experiencing intimate moments in private worship and devotion. You have to turn aside to see what's on God's heart. Likewise, the heart of God's servants and leaders will not always be understood or, at e or, at, or even experienced in the crowd. The heart of God's servants is uncovered in day-to-day -day work and witness for the kingdom. You may not ever know how much the Lord and the Lord's servants love you by the Sunday morning drive through where you place your order, pick up what you want, and move quickly to the exit, some without even paying for the good meal they've received. You will only get to know and appreciate the heart of God and God's service as you engage in discipleship and development as a believer. Somebody's got to be willing to stay after school. How many of you remember staying after school? Sometimes it hopefully was for the good reasons. Sometimes it was for the wrong reasons. But a lot of times staying after school helped you to understand some other things. And you got some relationship and you've, you got favor because you saw the teacher not in the classroom setting but in a different, more intimate setting. It depends on the heart of the one who's staying after school that will determine what you get from it. But Jesus is really clear as we find out in Matthew 5. He says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And if you can see God, you can see God's servants, God's people, God's work, God's plan, God's vision. Pastor, servant, leader, shepherd, everyone won't understand what God put in your heart for his purpose and glory until they are willing to separate themselves from the crowd. For the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and to return to his Father. He loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. Now he's bringing them in to show them love to the very end. Not only is there love that to the very end that you see and you're willing to separate yourself, but also there's the kind of love you can see not only through separation, but through number two, service. It is interesting to note that John records in the second verse, verse 2, that the devil had already entered Judas' heart. If the devil is in your heart, you can't see Jesus. And you can't see Jesus plainly for yourself, and you can't see him in other people when the devil is in your heart. But Jesus waits until one more movement to get us to the place of Jesus' exodus, of Judas' exodus. You notice how Jesus works? Watch the love of Jesus the next scene at supper. He gets up in the supper to go and wash the disciples' feet. Not only is there separation, we're not with the multitudes, we're not with the seven anymore. We're in the upper room with just 12. One of them is a devil. He's about to leave, but let me show you how, how it works in the inner circle. He gets up from the supper, takes off his robe, puts a towel on his waist, gets a basin of water and a pitcher of water, and begins to wash his disciples' feet. Touching feet is regarded as menial slave work, and as such was primarily an assignment given to Gentile slaves and to women. Students were respons responsible to rabbis to perform menial tasks of labor, but touching feet was clearly not expected. John the baptizer helped us to understand this principle by placing himself so lower than Jesus that he said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Jesus teaches his disciples that their love should know no bounds of service. Love ought to make you stoop if it's going to help someone else. That is why the resistance was so strong from the disciples because of how it looked and was valued by them. They didn't want to do for each other what Jesus had done for them. That kind of Christ love obligates them to serve because Jesus looked at them when he got through. He said, the same thing I just did to you, now you got to do it for each other. Shepherding is the lowest occupation in the world. Sheep are smelly. They make noise. They get lost. They will wander, wander off thinking that they know the way. Shepherds had to clean them. Shepherds had to tend them. Shepherds had to lead them. And when God said he wanted leadership for his people in Jeremiah 3.15, he didn't say, I will give you chief executive officers. He didn't say, I would give you chairmen, chairpersons of the board. He didn't say, I would give you operational officers. He said, I will give you shepherds 
When God wanted to lead his people, he chose David, a shepherd boy. When God wanted to speak to his people, he chose Amos, a shepherd. When God wanted to save his people, he sent the heavenly announcement to some shepherds who were abiding in the field. Their assignment was to go see the great shepherd who would save his people from their sin. Service. You can serve without loving, but you can't love without serving. Uh, let me replay, pause and rewind that and replay it one more time. You can serve without loving, but you can't love without serving. You ever meet people in church who are serving, but you know they don't love by how the way they treat people? <sighs> Ooh, I'm, I'm going to leave that. We talked about that Monday night, all right? You can't fake this for long. The absence of presence of love is going to show up eventually. You either love or you don't. It's about service. Pastor, servant, leader, shepherd, everyone won't understand what God put in your heart for his purpose and glory until they are willing to accept the call to serve. Not only separation and service, but in this service we find the model of leadership. I call it the psalm of servant leadership. You want to know what it is? You probably already know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Wait a minute now. If the Lord is my shepherd, that means you are a sheep. He does what? He makes me. Man, tell me what to do. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He what? He leads. That's a lot of responsibility. He leads me beside the still waters. What else does he do? He restores my soul. He leads me what? In the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley, or if you're in the hood, yea, though I walk through the alley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod is for the wolf. The staff is for the lost sheep. Yeah, did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? The rod is for the wolf. The staff is for the, the lost sheep. The rod is there so when the wolf and the lion and the bear come, I can beat them upside the head. That, that gives me certain comfort and protection that no matter what comes against me, the great shepherd is going to see to it that I'm watched over. But then that staff, that big nine-foot-tall hook, a uh, 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 rock, uh, 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 wood is there because, and you never know, know why the, sh the, the 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 staff is crooked. It's crooked because that crook exactly fits the underbelly of a sheep, so that with his arm and the extension of the rod, the shepherd can reach down into the cracks and crevices of life, hook you up and bring you up out. Oh, I wish I had somebody here and bring you up out of where you are. Shepherding is not an easy task. I'm not. They wander thinking they know the way to go, but you hook them and you bring them back in. Uh, that's what I say about separation of service. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Yeah, can't nobody <laughs> do me like the Lord. Well, not, not only separation and service, but also uh, that there's no end in sight to uh, God's love because of sacrifice. Look in the movement in verse 31 through 35. Watch, walk with me. When he was gone, who's that? Judas. Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. His enemy, his betrayer walks out the room and he says, now the son of man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's the interesting notation. After separation and service, Jesus takes them to another level. But before he does that, he puts the pretender out. He announces the betrayer. Once Judas is gone, he predicts Peter's denial, which lets he and others know that they're separate and ready for service, but they have one more test sacrifice. Peter, you ain't there yet, but I've already prayed for you that your faith would not fail. 
Uh, I, I know I lost Judas That's because the, the word can be fulfilled, but I'm not going to lose you, but you're going to go through something. You're, you're separate, and you're, and, and, and you're in this place of service, but you're not ready yet because you haven't made a sacrifice yet. This is where we separate the men from the boys, the women from the girls. This is where you have to put your big boy pants on, where you have to put your big girl dress on. I don't know what just happened just then. I'm, I'm not even going to look up from my iPad. I don't know what. I'll just, you know, I'll let y'all hear that how you want to hear it. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> hey, man, ain't no better place to preach than a black church. You know, they do talk. You know, they talk back to the preacher while they preach it. <laughs> this is the, dip, the epitome of call and response. <laughs> Jesus says to them, sacrifice is going to call me to leave it all. But be very clear, no one is taking anything from me. I'm giving it all to the Father. Why? Because of love. When you love, you will sacrifice yourself while comforting others at the same time. So as you hasten through chapter 13, you'll get over to chapter 14, which we love to hear in our times of need. And Jesus, on his way to the cross, knowing that he's going to be sacrificed, he, he loving us and helping us at the same time. He said, what? Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also me. Watch this. In my Father's house, there were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm getting ready to go so I can prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. When you love, you will sacrifice going where you may not necessarily wish to go while showing others the way to go. Thomas said to him in that fortune, Lord, show us the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. When you love, you will sacrifice and promise power for others when you're giving up presence. Jesus is giving up his presence in the room, but he's promising power on his way out the door. He said, my, I'm going to pray, and my Father is going to send a counselor. He's going to send a comforter who will lead you and guide you to all truth and righteousness, and in case you're a little overcome tonight, he'll bring back whatever I said to you. Pastor, servant, leader, shepherd, everyone won't understand what God put in your heart for his purpose and glory until they are willing to sacrifice. One thing about sacrifice that you have to get over. When you sacrifice, sometimes we sacrifice and we ask the question, does anybody see? Does anybody notice? We're studying on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. When you give, here's how you give. When you pray, here's how you pray. When you fast, here's how you fast. And all three of them have this same recurring theme. Uh, don't give so you can be seen. Don't pray so you can be heard. Don't fast so people can watch you. Uh, for your father who sees you where in secret is going to reward you openly. If it really is a sacrifice unto the Lord, you willingly offer it, you willingly give it to God with a joyful heart. You give God and you tell God, yes, you don't give to be seen, but you ought to be seen giving. Here's part of the reward, John 14, 22, 24. Judas, not Iscariot, there's another one in the room. Judas, not Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. The Father's love is the reward for separation, service, and sacrifice. Well, there's no end in sight. No, there is no end in sight. Here's, here's the end. Terminator salvation comes to a close. And the credits begin to roll. I'm back at the movie now. I'm sorry. Y'all got y'all with me? I mean, it's early morning class. I know the eight o'clock. How many of you had eight o'clock class in school? It was rough. Uh, it's the early morning. You ain't quite there yet. Some of you haven't had your second cup of coffee yet. You're about to go get it. I'm gonna let you go in a minute. Um, Terminator Salvation comes to the close, and the credits begin to roll on the screen. We don't know whether there will be another another movie in the sequel, which will show us the continuation of the heart of Marcus Wright inside of John Connor. I don't know that about the movie, but one thing is certain, Marcus Wright in that movie dies, and that's the end. 
at the, eventually at the end of every movie, we do know there is a statement that reads the end. Thank God when you have a leader that loves you enough to separate, serve, and sacrifice. A friend of mine who we funeralized a few years ago, great Cyrus Flanagan, wonderful preacher down in Tallahassee, Florida. One of the things that he, Cyrus always used to say is, you never leave the earth when you've shared God's love while you journeyed in it. <laughs> Just let that think. You never really leave the earth when you've shared God's love while you journeyed in it. See, we have the dispensational advantage in looking back on the text over 1,900 years since Apostle John shared his record of the story. John was walking in the story but was blessed to see the end of the story. Only then could he safely and con conclude and project an awareness on the part of Jesus that exuded the confidence we see in that first verse. Now, after this little lesson this morning, let's go back and look at that verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and return to his father. He already knew it. He loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Jesus had already turned the corner. Jesus had already prepared for rejection. Jesus had already prepared for betrayal. Jesus had already prepared for suffering. Jesus had already prepared for crucifixion. In the light of Jesus' pre preparation, John reflects and deduces that his posture on that night that he was betrayed was possible because of the most powerful force in the universe. In light of Jesus' preparation, John reflects and deduces that Jesus' position on that night he was betrayed was possible because of the most powerful force in the universe. In light of Jesus' preparation, John reflects and deduces that Jesus' proclivity on that night that he was betrayed was possible because of the most powerful force in the universe. The same apostle is the one who recorded these infamous words, which you oftentimes see at banners in football stadiums. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world <laughs> that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. While all the references are in the past tense, there's one thing that makes it present. There's no end in sight. He journeyed from the upper room to the garden. He journeyed from the garden to the home of Annas. He journeyed from the home of Annas to Pontius Pilate. He journeyed from Pontius Pilate to Herod. He journeyed from Herod back to Pilate. He journeyed from Pilate to the Roman guard. He journeyed from the Roman guard to a hill called Golgotha. And there on Golgotha, there was separation. There was service, and there was sacrifice. He commended his hands, his life, into the, into the hands of the father, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, who had showed up in chapter 3, came and claimed the body and laid it in a rich man's tomb. There's no end in sight. But aren't you glad that that's not how this story ends? Three days later, he rose again, and we call that love. No end in sight. Won't you stand on your feet in the presence of God today? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing today in the house of God and what your circumstance or situation is. But it is mine to extend to you the opportunity for a couple of things. First of all, you need to be saved. You need that saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first and foremost you need to have. Yeah, we're called to separate and, and then called to service and we're called to sacrifice. But you have to, as the word says, come out from among them and be separate. You have to give yourself to Jesus. Um, and he'll make a difference and a change in your life. If you've never accepted him as your savior, that's the most important invitation I can give to you today. To come to know Jesus and the pardoning of your sins. 
Uh, how's that done? Well, it's just as simply put as A, B, C. A, we admit we've sinned. B, we believe in our hearts that God sent Jesus to die for our sins, that he was raised up so we could be raised up into a life eternal. And C, we confess. What are we confessing? That Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. So if you're here today as a choir singing, I want you to think about your salvation journey and come on and connect with the Lord Jesus. Today's a good day to be saved. Today's a good day as the youth anointed vessels dance. It's a good day to tell him yes. If you're here, won't you come? Won't you come? When? When? Nothing else could help. Love lifted me. If you want to be saved, we invite you to come. Love lifted me. You want to be saved. Love lifted me when nothing else, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Second appeal is for those who need a church home. You say, you know what? I've been like some of those sheep. I've been wandering. I don't know my way. And maybe I'm in between churches. I was I moved here from another area. And I do need a church home. I'd love to be the under shepherd that serves and gives responsibility, uh, exercise of responsibility for your soul. I'd love to have you join me on this journey. The Union Bethel Church would love to have you join us on this journey. So if you need a church home, I'm inviting you to come now. Make your way out of those rows and come down one of these aisles. And because you know something, there's no end in sight to God's love. And so if you're here today, I invite you to come. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Come on, let's sing with uplifted voices. Could have love lived in me. Oh, love lived, love lived in me. Love lived me. When nothing else could have love. And there's another verse. What? God gave his son. Yeah, you got it? Know that one? God gave his son when nothing, when nothing else could help. God gave his son. Oh, God gave his son God gave his son when nothing when nothing else could help God gave his son now if you know there's no end in sight to God's love come on and put those blessed hands together and give the Lord some praise and glory in this place. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your separation, your service, and your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before we get ready to read the tithe litany, allow me to place this particular burden. Just play softly. Amen. Allow me to, play, to place this particular burden on your spirit. Uh, we've been asked to share with the eighth episcopal district that's consisting of the states of mississippi and louisiana and i didn't do the little benevolent offering early for that so i'm gonna ask the stewards if we can have maybe a tray on each side 
Is that possible that we can do that? We need to receive some extra gifts to help out with that appeal. We're sending that up to the second Episcopal district. We have lost, we have congregations whose homes have flooded out, whose churches are not able to meet because of that. Now, with that in the, going on, we know that something's happening in Florida, and we're going to need to do something with that too. But how many of you know that when it's your time of need, you'd love somebody to reach out to you too, amen? And we thank God for all the government agencies, all the NGOs who are working to help, but we want to make sure specifically that our people have taken care of. And so I'm giving you just a few more minutes to, as they say, just break off a little something extra, amen? And uh, in this service, and you can put it uh, in the trays that are, come on, Brother Montgomery, if y'all come on, amen, let's prepare so we can have this positioned properly, um, and we'll ask you that's it, right? Just two trays on either side, I think that would be it, and that's where we will put something extra into, all right, for the people of God, amen? All right, so one on each side. So let's now prepare to read the tithe litany together. Um, and recited it is in pa on page four of your worship guide. Are you ready? I tithe because it is a direct command from God. I tithe because the tithe is holy unto God. I tithe because God commands his people to do so. I tithe because it is an evidence of consecration. I tithe because tithing makes me conscious of my partnership with God. I tithe because after getting nine-tenths for myself, I should not then use any part or all of God's one-tenth. I tithe because God promises a curse upon those who rob him by refusing to tithe. I tithe because I believe in prayer and I stand in need of God's help every day for which I must pray. I tithe because I need and want the blessing which God promises to those who tithe. I tithe because the tithe is the debt which every man owes God. God is the first creditor, and debt to him should be paid first. Let's take that gift and hold of the presence of the Lord. Thought, Father, thank you for the seed and the sower, the gift and the giver. We bless your work with tithes and offerings, and we come bringing sacrificial gifts to minister to those in need in the 8th District. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have gifts that you want to bring to the, um, to the merchant terminal, they are in the back left corners of the church. In name of Jesus, won't you come now? <laughs> 